Hello once again, and um, as you can see here, we're going to be doing a little bit of uh, uh, keynote gymnastics up here today. So, um, uh, so we're just going to play it. Uh, no, let me. There we are. Um, you came today to hear me speak about failing forward. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll get into that first after uh, talking a little bit more about design thinking, as if you haven't heard enough today. Uh, but we'll focus on a few of the points that I think are uh, more important and often left out of the process. Dr. V Victor Bedu uh, is a colleague of mine from the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design in Potsdam, and we'll be joining him uh, shortly by Hangout, courtesy of Google. Build on the ideas of others, one voice at a time, go for quantity, Accept all offers, ideas arrive shared, fail often and early. These are all part of the design thinking culture. Uh, the last one, fail often and early, takes a little deeper meaning for us, I believe, because, well, with business as it is now, in the hierarchical structures that we're up against, in industry that we're trying to change, we can sometimes collide and come up against the wall. And so we hope that there's a little more compassion in failing often and early. And when we do fail, that's when we hope that there's a little more compassion. And that that is changing the culture of industry as we had known it. This is David Kelly, co-founder of IDEO, as well as co-founder of the D School at Stanford. I want to play his definition of design thinking for you. So here's the first part of our keynote gymnastics. I have to escape and hide it, and then <coughs> bring up our movie, and then play it. Okay. So, design thinking has really come out of a concern for the user. We used to think we've got to get our big ideas by putting smart people around the table and somehow it'll come out of our heads, or that we'll invent a technology that will force on the rest of the world. But user-centeredness means we go and try to understand people, try to find their needs, especially non-obvious, latent kind of needs. We go and try to understand what they really want then we're really on firm ground, as a, and so we can then deliver what they need. That was a piece that I did for the Decon Festival. Okay. So, design... <laughs> and it repeats. Um, I don't know if any of you attended in Potsdam 2012, anybody here? <sighs> Andre did. Good, good, good. Uh, we brought uh, members of industry, education, and research to Potsdam uh, to engage in design thinking, uh, predominantly uh, given by students at the Hasso Plattner Institute, as well as some uh, uh, keynote speakers from around the world, uh, Australia, France, uh, the US certainly. David Kelly came in by Skype, uh, but a number of the other uh, founders of the D School were present, and I'll introduce them in a bit. So a little bit more gymnastics to go back to our PowerPoint, our keynote rather. There we go. So I checked with one of my former professors, um, Michael Berry, and sent him my ideas for the uh, keynote, and uh, he sent back my ideas about uh, failing forward. Uh, suggesting that I go into the earlier um, steps of design thinking first before talking about failing. So I took his advice. Design thinking, as you know, is the intersection of 
feasibility, viability, usability, and desirability. It offers sustainable design intervention. And the greatest aspect of that sustainability is the human-centeredness. What I love about it is that the innovations can be products, services, policy, really cool uh, in Denmark, there in Copenhagen, as a company called Mind Labs. And they are focused on policy, on government policy. And happy to hear there's also a design team now in Washington, D.C. And so uh, I want to encourage more and more policy coming out of design thinking. Uh, curriculum, School of Education at Stanford, we're creating curriculum through design thinking. And scripts. I have a project in Potsdam at the uh, Film University in Babelsberg, and uh, next spring we are exper experimenting with design thinking for films for children. Very excited about that. The multidisciplinarity is my favorite part of design thinking. In the uh, 10 Faces of Innovation, which is David Kelly's brother's Tom Kelly's book, he talks about the 10 people at IDEO, the anthropologist, the biologist, the lawyer, the business people, the filmmakers, the, the, the Noah's Ark of uh, people that they have at IDEO, and this is how it works. At Stanford here, you can see we've got all of the schools represented, medicine, business, social science, education, des uh, design, and engineering. And the, the industry, of course, comes in through our partnerships. And they're real partnerships. When I was in school there, I did work with Pepsi. Uh, and you'll see uh, samples from Herman Miller. Um, who else did we work with? Oh, Fidelity Savings. Uh, People, real people were coming, real people, real companies with needs were coming to Stanford to allow these fresh minds to uh, work on their problems. And what a great learning situation for it. So for all of those who are setting up design thinking programs, get your schools involved. Uh, in Paris right now, at uh, D School Paris, Paris East, they're just establishing, but the first year, uh, they insisted on training the teachers that are there, training the professors that are there, before engaging in bringing in students. So I think this is really, really vital. Work with the people who are already here, working uh, or in, and who are engaged, and then bring in new people. I think that's, I think that's uh, really smart of Perry East. Uh, that's where I fit, sort of in between design and education. I'm uh, basically an artist. That's my T. So I think many of you know what the T profile is. This is my specialty, what I've spent a lot of years doing. Uh, I started out in dance theater. That helps uh, presentations and with trusting. <coughs> I've, uh, and I still do, organize film festivals and presentations of international films for young audiences. And I make documentaries and, and films, and uh, that's probably the, the hardest one, <laughs> because you can't do, uh, make a film every year. Not yet, anyway. So, arts and education and design thinking. The design thinking is what connects our disciplines. So the design thinking process, as you know it, recognize it, understand, define, ideate, prototype, test. While I was going through D school early on, I uh, had a little trouble with this because, you know, I had met a couple of IDEO designers and gone to their office and it just didn't quite feel like that at D school. And what was the difference? What was missing? Well. What was missing was the team empathy, how much these designers at IDEO knew each other. How were we going to establish that really important part in six weeks? Or even, you know, even in 
six months. In six months it was hard. I engaged in uh, a class that was a six month class and it was still really hard. So that's why it's vital that you preserve these um, relationships that you're making here today and in your design thinking uh, exploits as they, as they continue because uh, we're a network and we understand each other and that can deepen and this is how we create a greater team empathy. Um, when you're starting out as a, as a group, as a new team, it's really important to spend time outside of the work time and outside of the workplace. I'll elaborate on that team empathy to no, as no one trusts. No one trusts the people you're working with. First, you've got to trust yourself. First, you've got to trust your senses, and um, your, your body is your tool. I mean, that, that understanding comes from dance, but it also, uh, while I was studying qualitative research in, at, at Stanford, um, the professor, Denise Pope, said, your eye is the camera. I thought, oh yeah, of course. My body is the tool. My eye is the camera. Trust what you see. Write it down when you're doing ethnographic research, right, the first part of understand, trust what you see. There's not a lot of time to edit if you're writing it down. So trust that, trust that, and um, trust in the capacity to learn. You are still a sponge, especially when you're open and excited about learning new things. Um, trust your ability to learn. Trust what you know and ask about what you don't know. Um, I know that at Stanford especially, we, we often butt heads. We're a lot of type A people, if you know, people who are leaders and doers. And we all end up in one group and there's a real tassel sometimes. And thank goodness there's design thinking to keep us all Friends. in a process. What was that? Friends. Friends as well, as well, as well. Well, we, we will see what can happen. Friends make the worst enemies. <laughs> because they know you so well, that's right, that's right. So it's, it's important to remain friends and say yes and, right? Accept all offers. That's a really important uh, aspect of design thinking that comes out of improvisational theater. And if you get a chance to do improvisational theater, take it. And if you're setting up design thinking classes, bring in somebody from an improvisational theater and learn some techniques. Maybe we do something. Maybe tomorrow we'll <laughs> do something. But uh, the yes end is really, really valuable because that keeps the flow coming. If you uh, take a look at The Art of Innovation, one of the earliest books from Tom Kelly, um, I think on the third page, he says, design thinking is trying to do away with the devil's advocate. <clears throat> for years, it was acceptable for someone to say, I'm going to be the devil's advocate and say your idea is horrible. Where does that go? It stops it. In, in um, improvisational theater, that's called blocking. You can't go anywhere. You can't continue and open up your scene. You can't play anymore. And that's exactly what happens when you're in a brainstorm and somebody says, oh, it's a bad idea. How's that going to work? Bleh. No more energy. Done. So yes and is really vital. And you'll find out, I think, that yes and is really vital to life. I use it a lot, <laughs> I use it a lot. Yes, but becomes yes and, try it. <laughs> All right. And uh, of course, spend time outside of work time. Uh, if you're like me, when I go to work, I work. And uh, you know, we have fun doing it, but if there's some team things to be taken care of that need to be addressed, you like you get to need to get to know each other, take time to do that because it's sort of, you need to be more relaxed about it. When, when I'm working, I'm kind of sprinting a little bit. I've got a different energy going. So I need to be relaxed and, and listening and exchanging. So that's really vital. Ah, this is fun. Uh, this summer, I got a chance to teach kids innovation. So I was teaching them what I learned in graduate school to 10-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this has, again, the, the happy dancer gets to show you 
what this is. This is be visionary. So feel free to join me. Be courageous. Be collaborative. And again, this, this is corporeal learning. In the speak of education, this is corporeal or uh, embodied learning. Reflective. And be determined. So we, through the workshop tomorrow, I'll try and, and use those more. Be visionary. Be courageous. Be collaborative. Be reflective. And be determined. Got to be determined to get through the ambiguous parts of design. Uh, as the gentleman before me said, yeah, we're often anxious to get to the prototyping, right? And we don't want to do the empathy part, but that's the research. That's, that's the important, you have to get there. There's a school, I just read about it, a school of, uh, in the US called Changemakers School. And they've got kids doing innovation. And the story of a little girl who came to this school, didn't have much English but they gave her a role of a shopkeeper. And so through that, she developed her English a little bit more. She had to look after her customers. And because she did that so well, she rose up to management. And, and this is all you know, sort of fictitious in a school, but they give them these actual roles. And their um, MO, their modus operandi, is to care for people, to have empathy, to listen, and to take time to find out what they need. And kids are doing that. Kids are doing that. The group I worked for this summer was called Galileo Learning. So you can take, take a look at that there. Uh, so there's another Stanford person, a couple of Stanford people, and um, they've got camps all over the Bay Area, now going into Los Angeles, which uh, each run, one uh, lasts a week and is run by a narrative arc. So there's a story. We went down under this summer. We went on a road trip across the United States. Uh, we went back in time to um, uh, Galileo's Apprentice. So each the kids got a chance to be in a story and learn innovation techniques through this story. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Take a look at it online, Galileo Learning. Some more reading about creative confidence, because that's really what we're talking about here in the uh, Team Empathy Square, um, creative confidence. I would like to tell you uh, that I'll prepare a book list and have that at the end to um, email to all of you. Uh, it's not only David and Michael Kelly, but there's a lot of uh, good American writers um, not only about design thinking and design, but also uh, creativity. And Malcolm Gladwell is one. Uh, Robert Gruden is another. Um, so. And these other guys, they're all D-School founders, co-founders. And um, Bill Moggridge, the late Bill Moggridge, Larry Leifer, George Campbell, Bernie Roth, Julian Gorodowski, Gorodsky, and Terry Winograd. If you see anything by them, pick it up because they're going to be talking about uh, design thinking. The understand part. Uh, I was with a group who went to China, went to Beijing, and I was working with the Herman Miller Company. Herman Miller Company is a, a long-standing American furniture company, and they're investigating aging in residence, so creating old folks homes in Beijing. A place where uh, the one child ruling that had been happening since 1969, I think, during the Cultural Revolution, um, was creating a phenomenon of a need for places to put the elderly. Because they were, they were, all of the one children were marrying and having four sets or, or two sets of parents, and then there were still grandparents. So there's a, a burden, a considerable burden, on a great part of the population in China. So Herman Miller was pretty smart to come to D-School and ask us to do research. Um, one of the most important things I think is uh, to remember is that users are experts, and let them tell you 
what they know. I as a camera, we saw that. And five wise was mentioned earlier, thank you. Here we've got three very different stories. Um, and each has different needs. The woman at the top, she had been a radio announcer in Beijing, and then the Cultural Revolution came and she went to work in a car factory for 20 years. Her need was to be recognized. The gentleman there, and the, this is all under one roof, and one of the finer, um, one of the few, really, and it was uh, fine, um, elderly residences in Beijing. The gentleman on the left, uh, was a retired government official, so he was probably on the other end of the Cultural Revolution and sharing a roof with the woman who uh, lost her, her job and her livelihood and her identity in the Cultural Revolution. So you can imagine there's a lot of varied needs, needs under the same roof. So we, unfortunately, we were not that courageous and we tended to focus on the couple below who were former opera singers with the, um, with the Peking Opera. And their need was long life and to archive when it came to their furnishings. Reframing is the original challenge, the real problem, and define one persona that you're going to design for. I think you all know design thinking well enough that uh, you know that defining with verbs as well as noun <laughs> are, uh, it, it is vital. So you've got to think about those qualities and, um, and actionable words. What we ended up doing with these lovely elderly folks who said to us, we're still beautiful and we're still active. Make something for us. So we ended up with a how might we that went something like this. How might we create comfort and care, thinking of the other stakeholders who were their families, right? While recognizing the still very lively engagement with modern life. These people put on a fashion show for us when we arrived. It was really, really something. So the, and we're ideating now. Now we've got our information. We've been researching. We had a crew that, uh, a crew from Central Academy of Fine Arts and Peking University that came to Stanford, and then we went there. And uh, I really encourage that kind of cultural exchange. Um, China is probably really open to it, and I, I bet you probably have a sister city program already uh, with Krakow, so investigate it. These design imperatives came out of further rendering of our ideas. Furniture that has, has a conversation with its users. Chairs become a partner. We saw elders dancing in public. Regular um, tea dances on a Sunday afternoon out on a square. It was incredible. Effortless exercise that offers an edge and fits the Chinese sensibility of exercise in everyday life. What I expected from Beijing was wall-to-wall -wall people. Not at all, because everything is constantly moving. I was really surprised. There's a need for a gift. Uh, the mise en abime, uh, again, Michael Berry showed me that a mirror reflects the, reflects your family, reflects the dignity that the elder has learned, reflects the user's health and the care that they gave to their children. Mirrors became something that was really vital for us to use. Storage that would help the user decide what to keep. In these rooms we saw three and four different kinds of storage uh, devices. Some cheap, some wooden, some very simple, but three or four different styles and different types. And of course, they had to be wise and elegant, efficient, and wise use of space. These are the design imperatives that gave us more power to act on a prototype. So we made some 
very low res things like this. A hot water bag chair. This is paper <laughs> using a little uh, pink highlighter marker. And the idea was that we'd fill this up with warm water for the bathroom because one of the insights we got from the elders was in the bathroom, everything is cold. We've got cold surfaces and uh, you've just gotten out of the shower and because elder people move more slowly, you get cold faster. So we came up with a chair that would keep them warm. But then we came up with this. Well, wait, first we tested, of course, right? And show, don't tell, you're going to hear that a lot with design thinking. Again, the bias towards action, show, don't tell. Um, our user feedback, just an example. Uh, one woman said she liked the idea of a foot massage. One of our prototypes was wooden with all things, uh, sorts of things attached to it and a little roller surface for the feet. That made it in. But they didn't like the idea of wood. Um, didn't think that was the right material because these people are actually, they wanted, they wanted something modern. So let me show you what we got. There's the tango chair. Why the tango? Because we saw these people dancing in the squares and they were having a great time with it. And the tango, here again, you know, that dance influence, it really helped come and came in here. Anybody dance the tango here? Uh -huh. wow. Okay, okay, okay. So you know the secret is, is that gentle pressure to the inside with your partner, right? And that's what's going on here. Not only, not only was there a just gentle pressure in that pushed back, but that was a partner. And it was really vital to see that for elderly folks, things, their, their furniture, their, their, their belongings, especially their furniture, an old chair, became a partner. And it was something that they really loved and needed. And especially if they lost a partner, you could imagine how important a, a chair that gives them delight uh, and comfort is, is to them. And what, <laughs> this is great, this is a, a black mesh and it's a somewhat elasticized and you can push back and it pushes back to you and you push back and it pushes back to you. So you're doing a little bit of exercise. And this, it expands, it can come around, you can hug yourself someone can work with it. And you see here, you can rub your hands over the top and massage as well as the foot, the, the foot massager that fits under the seat. Now, we haven't heard if Herman Miller has built that, but I'm not a furniture designer. I just participated on a team that w wanted to find something for elders that felt, helped them feel like they were still in the game, yet they were comfortable and had an edge for staying healthy. So, you know, I, I, I felt like a designer after that. And um, I think that's the valuable part of design thinking, uh, is that you do feel part of change. So, in that group, well, we had some moments of proof and we had some hard times. But what we hope is if you uh, use the design thinking techniques and always warm up together and debrief together, then your team will develop a groove. But what if it doesn't? What if something happens? What if you're behind schedule? Have doubts, disagreements about the feasibility or the viability? What if you've lost funding and failures look lurking and you're up against the wall? How do you fall forward into the behaviors that you aspire to? Don't panic. Where's my life ring? <laughs> I'm using the life ring as a metaphor. 
and throw out the life ring. Veronica, will you catch the life ring? <laughs> and so, two people, at least two people in the team have to agree on the life, the right life ring being needed, and you toss it out and pull it in. But before that, you might need to call a friend who's also a coach. And my friend, Dr. Victor Beto, is waiting for us. Oh, and he's been waiting for some time. So <laughs> I'm going to use uh, Google Hangout now and give him a call. <coughs> Victor? You know, Victor, I've got a team of five, and two of them are threatening to pull out because they just don't think this thing is feasible. Ah, okay. Why, why do they think so? What did they say? Uh, well, they don't like the prototype. They, they, think that they think the prototype is just not going to work. Well, uh, Motivation is down and they kind of lost lost the trust in the whole project then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've thrown them the life ring. And we're going to pull them together. What would you think is the next step? Okay, I, I guess um, they have to, in the team, somehow find um, trust again. And I think it's a, it's a good um, way to kind of um, see how the prototype does in mm -hmm. tests. I don't know. Did you did, did the team already test some, or or are they going to test again? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea that we should go back to those tests. And, and really take a look at them and scrutinize them better. I think that if, um, if, you, if you go back to decisions uh, to a point where everybody was still on the same boat, you could um, um, consider testing also in other way. And, uh, and then the people should say what's a good prototype. The, the feedback from the user should um, kind of be the validation. And um, it's okay if it's okay if, if, if recent tests didn't work out. Um, that's good because it's one way you can rule out already. So um, um, I would I would bring them to to um, put up a new iteration, maybe to discuss together. Um, like if the two persons in the team have arguments why it shouldn't work, somehow see what users said, and based on that um, put up a new test. And I think sometimes if the who don't see their inputs taken, and if these two persons who are disappointed now can bring in the, 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 the ideas and the team just takes them and, and tries to find the place in, in the working space and the tools and tries to put it, I think this should rebuild trust also in the team and in the process. If you see that what arguments and what what um, yeah why where your input finds its place. So I would I would try to go back and set up a new test maybe, or, or do a short iteration. I, I think that's a really good idea, but I, you know what, I would take them out of the working space, because I, I think the same space is giving them a little bit of tension. Maybe I can pull out the, the, the whiteboard, or maybe we go someplace else, we go outside. I can imagine that if, 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 uh, if you have time now, uh, or maybe on the end of the day, um, you could just, um, Yes, leave, leave the working space and sit together, have a beer and, and discuss what went well for... Maybe there is something on the team level, just discuss how, how, how input was taken, um, whether something was too slow or too fast for someone, whether someone just dominated the team without knowing, just from the best intention, but just repressed input from others. So maybe they could just sit back and, and honestly talk about um, how they perceive their role than other others. It's better to do it now than later. Yeah, completely, completely. So I think we, we get them out of the space, decompress, and 
and go back to that point where things started to go wrong and sort of zoom out, look around what happened to it at, at that time and, and how the steps that went into that. You're right. And maybe we find the, the place that, where the problem is. And most importantly, we have to let the team know, or that maybe the one person who caught the, the life ring, that it's a shared failure. It's not their fault. It's really important that they know that it's a shared failure. When something happens in a team, we share the ideas and we share the failures, right? That's right. It's OK. Because um, if, if you wouldn't do anything about it and not even admit that something is going wrong, you just drag this along and it won't get better. And if you very quickly try to react, um, you can think the teams renegotiate the role. And in the project, um, before putting too much effort in the final product, just to set up a few small iterations. So um, fa failure is OK um, if you admit it. Um, to try to admit it early and um, to find a way of dealing. And I think what you said that zooming out is a good idea. When we work in design thinking, it's very visual. Um, we also use lots of visual tools. So you literally can step back and, and have a look on the bigger picture very often. So that's maybe a good idea to identify where, where to go in again and how. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned something the other night and helping your team become failure resistant by reiterating a lot early on. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, in my experience, um, you always see this presentation of design thinking where you have the bubbles and the phases that come yeah. after each other. And even though you are made aware that you can come back to different phases if you realize, for example, on the end, you tested something and you realize you need the research here, or you need more ideation there. Um, that's easy to say, but if, um, if you practice it, you realize, for example, in a six-month project, you only go through these steps in like six months and arrive on the end at testing, but you might like, put on a first iteration, the whole, the whole process, in the first two days. And then another one, again, two days long, just to, to go quick round, find also in a safe place to fail because you just invested two days. You didn't invest too much money and um, the team time. So you very quickly can move out of the first misunderstandings between permanently failing also with bad ideas. But um, this is actually learning, obviously. And um, the next time you start to do more informed iteration, it might be more long and take time for detail. Uh, you put only effort and energy and money into ideas and prototypes where um, yeah, after a lot of failing a lot, and a lot of learning, you will develop bad, bad ideas. Yeah, and then by that time too, the team cohesion must be probably really great and they're going to be like garage band at that point. <laughs> ah, yes, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Okay, Victor, thank you. I, uh, Victor and I talked earlier about uh, uh, the metaphor for the life ring, a kit that we'd like to give to all of you to, and encourage you to have that kit when you go forward to companies to offer them design thinking or to uh, work for them with design thinking in your kit. Um, the failure kit or the team saving kit, uh, we'd like to offer that to you. But first we're going to say thank you and goodbye to Victor. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye from Krakow. Okay, good. And look at this choreography on Kino. <laughs> All right, there we go. Back to it. That was Victor. Victor is a Hungarian philosopher. It's nice to know a Hungarian philosopher. <laughs> he's, a, he's an urban game designer. Um, and uh, sets up games in the city, sometimes using virtual reality, sometimes using just chalk. Really incredible stuff. And uh, you can look him up. There's your team saving kit. Uh, at the start, as part of your team, 
we recommend agreeing to having a team saving kit, a life ring. I, I had to send the crew here a, a, a notion that we would have these beautiful life rings to put up on your office walls or your, your wherever and have that prepared for when you do have one of these emergencies, these team emergencies. But these cost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, really, I mean, they, they cost like uh, 180 euro and some, they're quite, uh, I, I don't know why. But anyway, the metaphor is good enough and we've got some great ones there, thanks to Veronica. The line, I, I encourage these, I mean, it's a lot of fun too. The line is really important because you have to pull your team in, right? <laughs> um, in that content, uh, in, in the kit, you need to come together immediately at breakdown. Maybe it's a checkoff list, something like a first aid kit. Come together immediately after a breakdown. The natural instinct is, to, oftentimes, is to stop speaking to each other. Don't do it. Bring yourselves together. Sit in a chair together. Or get as as Victor and I talked about. Get out of the workspace. Change it. Recall the team's original intention. What excited you to work together? Go back to the scene of disagreement, just as we just talked about. And zoom out, look around it, step back a few steps, and see maybe where it went wrong. Reiterate often and become more failure resistant. Archive the failure and reiterate. And mark that in your team saving kit. And it might have happened that you had this breakdown because you weren't warming up and debriefing together regularly. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, we're just a team of four. Let's just get together. Find a warm-up that you like together. And so it's yours. But do it because that gets you on the same step. And when you debrief, you've sealed it up. You've put the punctuation at the end of the day's sentence. You can go home, be clear-minded, and then come back the next day. Use team considerations regularly. This is something from the D shrink at D school that I brought to Hassel Plattner Institute in Potsdam, and um, where it wasn't used as much, and it really should have been. These are things where we're looking at um, grading, in a sense, uh, team members. Are you vociferous? Are you voicing, expressing much? Maybe not so much this week, and do this often. Um, I'll have to show you it another time. I didn't pre prepare, but I will uh, send that around with the uh, reading list. Um, and so, with that life-saving kit, I would like to send you off to Innovate in Krakow and the team of 500 uh, who's continuing on through the week. I'd like to send you forward to Innovate with this quote from one of my favorite innovators, who is Buckminster Fuller. He said, the things to do are the things that need doing, that you see need to be done, and that no one else seems to see need to be done. Then you will conceive your own way of doing that which needs to be done, that no one else has told you to do or how to do it. That's innovation. Go forward and innovate. Thank you.